The average amputation takes 12 minutes. No antibiotics, no knowledge of infection. They don't even stop to wash their hands or instruments. Surgeons work round the clock. It's the source of the term old sawbones. Lloyd will be one of the lucky ones. The odds of surviving an arm amputation, 77%. Rufus Dawes and his men are among the few Union defenders left on Culp's Hill. They move down to counterattack. Dawes and his men win their skirmish. But like day one, they're the exception. Nearby, Ridgely Howard's unit captures a key section of breastworks. They keep advancing against heavy enemy fire. The Federals opened on us from front, left, flank, and rear, and the firing was terrible, increasing with each step we took. Still, we pressed on. just 500 yards from the Baltimore Pike, in a position that would threaten the entire Union line. But at night, an unfamiliar ground, a great opportunity is lost. They would be in the rear of the Union Army. They could be on the flank of the Union Army. But because of something so simple, darkness, they don't even know how close they are. Unable to tell friend from foe, they cease firing. If the Confederates had managed to carry Culp's Hill on the evening of July 2nd and break through, they would have captured the Union communications line on Baltimore Pike. All of the uh, supply wagons were there, reserve artillery was there. That would have forced Meade to retreat, and it could have been a major turning point in favor of Confederate victory. As the fight on Culp's Hill dies down, the Union wins a different kind of battle. Their newly formed intelligence agency, the Bureau of Military Information, is trying to discover Lee's battle plans. BMI agents are interrogating Confederate prisoners and realize they have captives from every rebel infantry division but one, George Pickett's. He has Lee's only fresh troops. Meade expects the rebels to attack tomorrow with everything they've got. It's a good bet George Pickett will lead the attack. Ah! 
Tomorrow, Ridgely Howard will face his Maryland neighbors in a fight to the death. And Robert E. Lee will launch one final all-out assault, Pickett's Charge. Gettysburg, day three, 5 a.m. The stakes have never been higher. Yesterday, Robert E. Lee was on the verge of all-out victory. Confederate troops assaulted the Union's left flank and nearly broke through. Robert E. Lee knows he came very close, but no cigar. General Meade's actually a little shaken. He knows it was a very close run thing, barely escapes disaster. Now rebel troops are gaining ground on Lower Culp's Hill and are positioned to threaten the Union's rear lines. Meade sends in reinforcements. One Union brigade is led by Colonel James Wallace, educated, wealthy, also from Maryland. The only Union colonel who owns slaves. Get over here, quick. During the Revolution, his grandfather and Ridgely Howards fought in the same regiment. Today, the two Marylanders will battle each other. Maryland, like other border states, is torn apart. So many divided loyalties. Maryland, they had to decide which side they were on. Maryland is one of five border states, loyal to the Union, but slavery is legal. Passions for and against slavery run hot here. Federal troops occupy Baltimore throughout the war to prevent a Confederate uprising. On Culp's Hill, Ridgely Howard's unit prepares to attack. Their target, defenses held by Union troops from their home state. the solemnity of the occasion and to understand the desperate nature of the charge to be made. I prayed for strength to do my duty. Last night, the rebels outnumbered Union defenders three to one. Now, those odds are reversed. It appeared to me as if the whole of my company was being swept away by the awful shower of shot and shell flying around us. A demon seemed to take possession of me. I had but one thought, to avenge my comrades. Maryland Regiment. I felt a burning 
in my thigh, as if all the blood in my body was rushing to one spot. It is a hard thing to say, but I am convinced the Federals deliberately shot at us while we lay there helpless on the field. A soldier at my left was shot. I was also struck in the hip. Hip wounds are almost always fatal. Every moment I expected would be my last, so I straightened myself out, folded my arms over my breast, and waited for my time to come. Time slows as Ridgely Howard prepares to die. James Wallace won't let a fellow Marylander suffer, no matter which side he's on. The first Maryland Confederate met us and were cut to pieces. We sorrowfully gathered up many of our old friends and acquaintances and had them carefully and tenderly cared for. I don't know how long I lay. Seconds would seem to be minutes and minutes hours. Coming to Howard's aid, the soldiers he'd least expect to help. The same Union troops who shot him. They asked what regiment I belonged to. I replied, the Maryland Battalion, to which they made answer, do you know you are fighting your own men? I answered, yes, and we intend to fight them. With the rebel assault on Culp's Hill stalled, Robert E. Lee readies one more massive attack. It will be one of the iconic battles of the Civil War. 12,000 Confederate troops, hundreds of cannons. The largest artillery barrage ever in North America is about to begin. After two days of attack and counterattack, Robert E. Lee is about to launch the offensive that will decide the Battle of Gettysburg and the course of the war. He's sending in 12,000 soldiers anchored by George Pickett's division, his only fresh troops. Their mission, attack the Union Center and cut the Army of the Potomac in two. Lee's pushing all of the uh, chips to the middle of the table because he knows it's his last chance he's going to have. This was a calculated decision. It was well thought out. It had a reasonable chance of success. Leading one of the rebel brigades, General Joe Davis, aristocrat, slave owner, his uncle, Confederate President Jefferson Davis. His hometown of Vicksburg, Mississippi, is under Union siege. To weaken Union defenses, 160 Confederate cannons move into position, a line of artillery two miles long. Against them, 100 Union cannons. It's 87 degrees, brutally humid. artillery barrage ever in the Western Hemisphere.
in some cases, rip apart. The membranes within the ear would tear. This would create blood streaming down the sides of these artillery units' faces. The artillery barrage can be heard in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, 40 miles away. Thinking he's crippled the Union's artillery, Union commanders silence their guns. By 3 p.m., Confederate artillery also stops firing. An eerie quiet reigned over the battlefield. All the smoke from that bombardment still sat on the windless day. The Yankees expected a huge attack from the Southerners. The Southerners knew what they were about to do and what they went up against. And it must have been an intense moment as they stared each other across the fields. it's safe to send in their troops. Time to set in motion one of the iconic battles of the Civil War. Joe Davis and his men move out. Part of a rebel assault that stretches a mile. they must cross 1,700 yards of open meadow, then race up a hill. But unknown to the Confederate leaders, the Union artillery still has plenty of firepower. They're just waiting for the rebels to come into range. Joe Davis and his men are marching into a barrage of artillery hell. four-and-a-half-inch strips of wrought iron. Invented just two years earlier, they're tough and reliable, designed with a three-inch groove bore for greater range and deadly accuracy. The ordnance delivers shells that explode on impact. And time shells and shrapnel that burst in the air over the enemy's heads. shot can take out 10 men. Being on the receiving end of one of these projectiles from the rifled ordnance would be completely devastating. You don't know what's coming at you. You can only imagine. And then all of a sudden, the guys that you are standing next to are gone, vaporized. Stopping to return fire in an open field is suicide. And there's no point. Their muskets don't have the range. Davis knows his men have to keep moving. We were growing thinner at every step. Under this destructive fire, which commanded our front and left with fatal effect, the troops displayed great coolness. We're well in hand and move steadily forward, regularly closing up the gaps made in their ranks. About halfway to Cemetery Ridge, the rebels come into range of the older style smooth barreled Napoleon cannon. The most popular artillery in the Civil War. It fires four kinds of ammunition including solid 12-pound cannonballs. Bounced in 
front of advancing troops, they can mow down a whole row of men like bowling balls. It's hard to conceive how men can keep going in the face of such opposition. The level of courage is intense and large. Until Davis and his men can return fire, they're just target practice for Union artillery. The attack that will come to be known as Pickett's Charge is being blown to hell. Lee's offensive is advancing toward enemy troops on Cemetery Ridge. Union artillery is mowing them down. It's the moment of truth at Gettysburg for both armies. Joe Davis and his men are now 400 yards from the Union guns. Canister range. Canister is the most devastating weapon of the day. Basically, tin cans packed with 28 iron balls. The casing explodes, spraying the iron balls into advancing troops at hundreds of yards per second. Canister shot just made that cannon a gigantic shotgun, and it would mow down up to 20 guys at a time, if not more. The guys would be completely tore apart, limbs, heads, arms, legs, and it was so demoralizing for the other soldiers to witness such an event. <laughs> Davis regroups at a dirt road, the Emmitsburg Road, 200 yards from the Union line. They're now within range of enemy muskets. fence they're using for cover takes 836 rifle shots. The brigade to the left of Davis hasn't caught up, exposing his flank and opening a hole in the rebel line. A few men under Davis make it to the Union line and plant their flag on a stone wall. A brave but futile gesture. The rest of the unit under Davis cracks and retreats. Rebel troops under George Pickett managed to break through and surge over the wall. Union gunners fire point blank. Now it's to the point of hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is as brutal as it gets. It is literally with musket butts and using fighting knives, using the bayonets by themselves as thrusting weapons. The rebels overrun three cannons, but they're soon overwhelmed. It's Lee's last chance for victory at Gettysburg, but it's not enough. They almost cut the Union Army in two. They almost did it. Robert E. Lee's great moment of promise quickly turned into his greatest defeat by far. The entire rebel line retreats. They are compelled, forced, to retire across that very ground in which they had made this brave, gallant charge. More than half of the force that began Pickett's charge is dead 
wounded, captured, or missing. Lee loses a third of his army at Gettysburg. It's the bloodiest battle ever fought on American soil. More than 50,000 casualties. Robert E. Lee's bold invasion of the North has failed. Independence Day. Rufus Dawes of the Iron Brigade turns 25 today. What a solemn birthday. My little band, now only 200 men, have all been out burying the bloody corpses of friend and foe. No fighting today. The Civil War will last another two years. Gettysburg wasn't Lee's last chance to win, but it was his best. He'll never come this close again. It gave Northern people the belief that Union Military High Command could in fact match Robert E. Lee on the battlefield. Nobody believed that the war was near an end, but many in the North, they took from Gettysburg solace, hope that in fact, this, the tide could possibly turn in their favor. For so many reasons, this battle stands out as a pivotal and significant American event. Rufus Dawes leaves the Army in 1864 with symptoms resembling post-traumatic stress disorder. His son, Charles will become the 30th Vice President of the United States of America under Calvin Coolidge. <laughs>